Well, I'm excited to be here. I think this is, uh, what is this, the fourth year, fifth year? Fourth, year. fourth or fifth year? Uh, and I, I'm, I'm excited about that. Uh, we've had, how many of you were here last year? Uh, how many of you remember what the, I, I, I probably won't need that, I don't guess I get, I get loud and moving and swinging or whatever. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Either way, how many of you remember last year um, Steve brought something and played it? Played. Do you remember what it was? Yeah, we do. <clears throat> was it year before last? Gosh, the years are seeming to run together. What was that? <laughs> Y'all remember? Nope. Was it the Golden Age? We are Stardust. We are Stardust. Stardust. Yeah, that's Stardust. And you remember, I, I actually, I taught, or I preached, or taught, or whatever I, that thing is I do, on Stardust. Mm -hmm. You're Stardust, that, out of Genesis chapter 2. That's what it says in Hebrew, a father. It's the Hebrew word, a father. A father. Y'all can do that, can't you? A father. 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 And so... People ask me, I've had people around the country say, how do I get light or star? Or how do I get uh, fire or star out of that particular word? Far. It's used, to say, it's used several times in the Hebrew Bible, and it's translated <coughs> dust. And so we always have this idea of dust. Well, now, because of where science is going, science has realized that actually all things that we call matter out in space are made up of what they call stardust, which are actually light particles. So even science has come to know that that is a fact. So if we are an amalgamation of stardust that's gathered here on this particular place that we call the Earth, then that's who we are. We're stardust. So we are light. And of course that validates Scripture that says, well, that's what God is. And so back home, we, uh, we need, I use that word need because that's... Uh, I grew up on my grandmother and my grandfather's farm and uh, grandmother would knead dough and make bread and you know I've seen her you know a woman really gets working on the dough she gets in and she sometimes just beat the hell out of it she <laughs> knead it squeeze it yeah, yeah. beat it you know the more you beat it knead it squeeze it and, all those, and that's exactly what we do with this book we call the Bible we knead it we squeeze it and I, I think that it's infinitum as far as the depth of what we can get from it. I don't think we have even scratched the surface of what's in this phenomenal yes. book. So for me, it is a non-ending saga of a continual digging. I can spend, sometimes I'll spend months and months in a verse of Scripture at home. And we just work with it, work with it, and seem to come up with something different all the time. So... When you can take 6, 8, 10, 12 Hebrew words and we make that a sentence and there seems to be an infinitum of kneading and squeezing that will continually extract life from it. And so that's, that's something that I noticed that we do and enjoy doing it, love it, matter of fact. And so I wanted to just share some things just in the introduction. The theme of this conference was what? Exactly. And so, wanted to, I, I'm not sure what all of you come for or what you're intending to come here for on this weekend because this is, what is this traditionally known of this weekend? Easter. Easter. That. Resurrection or what would you call it? Easter Bun Passover. Easter Bun. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and all of those, those, those tremendous nursery rhymes and we, we make puns of those. We throw stones at them. I remember, gosh, 25, 30 years ago when I was in full-blown charismania trying to back out of the charismania because I was seeing a greater picture than what I was being told and shared in the charismania. We would throw stones at things like Easter and the Easter Bunny and Santa Claus. I mean, I did a whole series on the cult of Santa Claus and how Santa Claus... And now then, if you've ever seen me do a teaching on the Santa Claustrum and understand the, what the, the claustrum, which is at the base of your spine, 
And the, the part up here, this is, we call the sacred Santa. That's where the word sacred and Santa are totally interchangeable. You can look at a, you can look at a Grace Medical Dictionary and find that out if you do that. And you'll begin to realize that the, sac the sacred claustrum or the Santa Claus is a pump that's at the base of your spine that pumps the fluid back up your spinal column into your brain to cause your body to give it function and feeling and emotion and all of the great things that you experience in your body that you just take for granted. And that's the story of Santa Claus going up and down the chimney. So even it's a nursery rhyme and we used to throw stones at it, it has tremendous depth in it that actually ties it into scripture and into astrology and into a lot of the ancient myths. And so a lot of the things that I know I used to throw stones at, I don't throw stones that much anymore. I, I just kind of sit there and say, ah, oh, ah. Oh. Well, I remember, I'm going back almost 40 years in my life, and I had a tremendous turnaround in my life. And at that time, I was in my mid-20s, and this is going back 40 plus years, and I was in my mid-20s, and my life had come to a screeching halt. Uh, I think I was 26, maybe 27 years old. And uh, <coughs> my life was completely turned around, and I didn't kneel at an altar in church. I actually was in a motel room, and in a motel room, I just cried out. I said, God, I really need some help here. You know? And so I had this probably the same mindset most all of you have. I had a religious mindset from being exposed to religion just by growing up in America. Did you know that you don't have to go to church to grow up in America to be exposed to religion? It's basically it's in the air that you breathe, and that's just that's not good, bad, right or wrong. But I remember probably 40 years ago, I had started a seminary course under the direction of Finus Jennings Dake, who is the author of the Dake Bible. And so I've worn out several Dake Bibles because I'm used to it. That's what I started out to try to memorize was the Dake Bible, so I know where it's at in the Dake Bible. People ask me why I use it. I said, well, it's not because of the notes. I promise you that. Because whatever Dake said, I go the other direction. But either way, I was working on my studies and I was in Florida. This is going back 40 years ago or more. I was in Florida and I was reading a, a, a huge book. A book that's uh, probably equal to this one or bigger. And it was called The City of God. Have any of y'all ever read that? The City of God. And who was the author of that great book? Augustine. And so the book was uh, around 800 to 1,000 pages. Difficult read. Written and, and basically, basically now, church history is built off the thesis that you get out of that book. That and another book. That and one other book that is supposed to be the historian of the church. And so what I wanted to do, and I just want to open this up because of the title. Uh, did anybody have a brochure? I just wanted to... Nobody had one? Okay. I didn't bring one either. <laughs> For the title? Uh, yeah. You can have it. Let, let me have it just a second. I just wanted to, to look at it. Forsaking, forsaking the history. Now, embracing the mystery. Now, if you throw something like that at me, that's like throwing slop in a bucket in front of a pig. I just gobble it up. And so... <laughs> So they threw that tile away. Whoa, yeah, I love that tile. I, I mean, I would like to work with that tile. And I am not a, uh, I don't like to offend or hurt people, but somehow or other things I say it gets people upset sometimes. And that's not my <laughs> intention ever at all to do that. It really is. Yeah. And I, so I apologize if it busts your bubble. Your bubble needed busted. <laughs> but there are three men who are major players. I'm going to mention these men, and I would say probably every one of you have heard these men, but I would also say probably that very few of you, if any of you, even know about these men. And the first one I want to mention is Constantine. And Constantine was the emperor of Rome, and you all know that, don't you? You know, it's like me. I want to get into the Vatican Library as, as bad as 
anybody that you know of, I want to get in there simply because one of the, one of the, I guess you could call it a hope, maybe, and I don't like to necessarily use that word a whole lot, but just one of the intuitive things that's inside me is that I pray that those priests were not so ignorant that they destroyed the Mayan material when they destroyed the nation of the Mayans in the 12, 13, and 1400s when the Jesuit priests went in there and began to love those people and then after a couple of, of uh, years, actually two centuries, 20 years, they began to turn on those people and mutilated them, destroyed them, killed them, women, children, old men, and dispersed that nation all over and got their, got their material. Such was the case and is the case of the Catholic Church if you go back and dare to go back in history and look at it. It's there and they don't try to hide it. I mean, it's, it's even in the Vatican uh, material. You can read the things that they have done throughout these last 1,700 years. But then one of the fellows I want to talk about is Constantine. And I wanted to read something about Constantine and I'm not sure that I even brought the piece of material that I wanted to read from about Constantine. But let me just tell you about Constantine. He was a tyrant, a murderer. He murdered his mother. Many of you don't know that. He murdered his mother after the formation of the Council of Nicaea. Now, I have you familiar with that term, the Council of Nicaea? All of you? And, and also, you probably, the Nicaean Creed, if you remember that, that, the Nicaean Creed? Well, the Nicaean Creed is where you get the phrase that you make, and you say it constantly, if you pay attention to it, what I believe, and then you fill it in. In other words, you put yourself in your own box and in your own prison and you don't even recognize it by just simply saying, yeah, I believe. And then you justify that belief. And you don't realize that you got that from the Nicene Creed because it's, where the, it's the Nicene Creed that establishes the beliefs that you have embraced that you call doctrine. You didn't get them out of the Bible because they're not in the Bible. Now I know that you have a, you and I both have a dilemma in the Bible when you read in the New Testament. You won't read this anywhere, but in the New Testament, you will read the Greek word pistis that in most cases is translated for faith. And faith is not what you and I have been told that it is. Faith is an intervention of God that's worked in your heart. That it got nothing to do with something worked in your head. It's worked in your heart. And the word pistis is translated faith, but it's also translated belief, but it actually should be translated trust. And what it is referring to, rather than to try to give you a system of beliefs, it's trying to give you that ability to trust that intuitive voice that you've got. Yes. I.e., you call it God. It's a real difficult word to use because we have so many different ideas of this term we call God. Right? Y'all on the page with me? Everybody okay? So Constantine was a tyrant. And Constantine formed, and he did it for political purposes. And we didn't know that. He was doing it for political purposes under the guise of religious purposes. And we failed to recognize that he married politics and religion in 326, and we have been the recipients of that lie ever since. And we think because we're in America that religion and the church and the state are separated. I'm sorry to tell you, they're not. They in bed with each other. <laughs> so, the religious community and the political community are both covered in a robe of deception if you and I would... And I believe there is an awakening and people are opening their eyes and we are beginning to see what's happening. So, so these three men, Constantine, who killed his mother, killed his son, and then on his deathbed promoted the idea that he got saved. <laughs> Hallelujah. Well, that wouldn't fly good in some of the traditional Protestant churches. They don't believe in deathbed salvation. <clears throat> so some of you may have been to those. Some of you haven't, I don't know. And then the other one that I want to talk about was his partner in crime. And I remember reading 
In the city of God, I remember reading about this character and then in other ancient material that I read back then 40 years ago, and I thought, why would we believe this guy? And this guy's name is Yusuf Ais. And he was a partner with Constantine. And Yusuf Ais lived, he was born around the period of time 260 and died around 340. And then Augustine, he was born around 354 and died around 430. So these men were just kind of stepping stones, even though Constantine and Yusuf Ais, they were partners in crime. They, they were together. And Yusuf Ais wrote what we know of today also as church history. But the thing about Yusuf Ais, I wanted to see if I could find this. I believe it's in here, in this particular book. And let me just read this to you, if you don't, if you don't mind. It says, one of the major players in the cover of operation was a character called Yusuf Ais, who, at the beginning of the 4th century, compiled from legends, fabrications, and his own imagination the only early history of Christianity. I let that bounce off a wall a little bit. Read that again. What's the name of the Listen to this. Let me, let me read this and let you get this. You can chew on this because, as a matter of fact, I remember again, I'm going back 40 years of studying the, the character of this particular guy. This particular guy had, had didn't have anything that you would call integrity. He was known as a plagiarizer and also he was known as one who manipulated and twisted material. And today he is... He is the authority of church history. So when you see you see these great men who are who have doctor or reverend on their name and they have their degree, their their DD degrees, and I got dozens of them, they have all of these things on them. It's just built off garbage. <laughs> and in North Georgia, we call it bullshit. So it has not, it doesn't have any validity if you understand what I'm saying. So, one of the major players in the cover-up of, 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 in this cover-up operation was a character called Yusuf Ais, who at the beginning of the 4th century compiled from legend, fabrication, his own imagination, the only early history of Christianity that still existed. Now let me back up and say some things about Christianity that most of you don't know. The Essenes, who lived three to five hundred years BC, were also known by another name, and that was Christians. So they were Christians because they understood the principle of the myth of the Christos, which is a Greek word that we get our word Christ from. And we are so ignorant in Christianity that we have been taught to believe. I say this apologetically because I was under I was in the same barrel or bucket that we've all been, that the name Christ was one of Jesus' names. And so I wouldn't dare call myself Lynn Christ or Christ Lynn. Then. But I would now. <laughs> so you are looking at Christ Lynn or Lynn Christ. So whichever way you would like it. The same way that the Essenes would understand that word or that type. And the same way that even the Gospels were referring to, if you understood it, and the same way that seven or possibly nine of the original epistles of Paul would use that word Christ. Because Paul was pretty much known as a Gnostic, not a Christian. And the Gnostics were the early church Christians. Because the Christians that you and I know of weren't born until after the Nicene Creed, 326. Prior to that time, there was a lot of upheaval and a lot of excitement in what was going on in this movement or this energy of a new revelation. And the revelation wasn't new, it had just been dressed in a different clothing and given a different name. Same story that had been told for thousands of years. And let me just go ahead and tell you right now what that story was. That story was about the dying and resurrection of the God-man. And what the emphasis of that story was about, it was not about one particular person that was special born, but it was about every human being that was born special. Yes. Yes. Because everyone that's born on the face of the
of the earth. No matter race, color, creed, we're all born as the monogenesis of God or those that were begotten by the one source only that could bring life. Which was God. And so when you read this word in, the, in your King James authorized translation, of course, <laughs> of the only begotten Son, just do you a little bit of simple Greek study on the word only begotten and you'll see it's the Greek word monogenes. hadn't got anything to do with one special Son. It has to do with everyone special born as God's Son. Yes. 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 Tremendous difference. So, this author, he says that Eusebius was compiling legends, fabrications, in his own imagination of the only early history of the church. Boy, I'm spitting all over my book. What's the name of the book? Uh, the Jesus Mysteries. There's a triology by Tim Freaky, Peter Gunn. If you haven't got them, if you haven't read them, then I highly would encourage you to get them and read them. They will might uh, curl your hair a little, but... Uh, Either way, all subsequent histories have been forced to base themselves on Eusebius' dubious claims. <coughs> because there has been little other information to draw on. What he's referring to here is there is little, and I will go out way on a limb here and say none, no information to draw on to produce a historical character called Jesus. None. Now, you know, I, I've been asked for a long time, <coughs> you believe, don't you believe in the literal historical Jesus? And I always try to skirt around that question. And I do try to skirt around it simply because of the backlash that's behind a simple answer. Because some questions don't need a simple answer. They need a very expounded answer because you need to know more about the story you need to have a, a broader picture before you know why I say that because if I give you a simple answer you draw a conclusion and blank boy you shut the wall down and you can't hear and that's your greatest problem that's my greatest problem the box you put yourself in limits you and your ability to hear what God wants to say so if God or Jesus Christ himself stood up here and said this you couldn't hear it so I skirt the question that I get asked all the time. And uh, you just pick up between the lines whatever you need to. Uh, again, I, I, my, my intention would not be to offend not one, not even the greatest or the least. All of those, uh, I'm reading again from this, all of those with a different perspective on Christianity were branded as heretics and, if possible, eradicated. Who did that? Do you understand what that word eradicated means? Get rid of them. Kill them. So you will see tremendous killing of especially women for over a thousand years. And you know what, was, what that was called, don't you? A thousand years of darkness. And what was that? That was when Constantine solidified the Council of 325, the Nicene Creed, and up until the Renaissance. And the Renaissance is still going on, but it's going on individually. This is the part of the Renaissance right now. Amen. And you understand the Renaissance is the Reformation. And the Reformation is what's taking place within you and me right now. Yes. You are being reformed to be yes. who you are. That's right. And that is the work. That is always the work, always has been the work still is the world. So the, they did to stop the Reformation. They thought they did. They tried to. The Reformation just went in every direction now. So we're still carrying it on. All, let's see here. All of those with a different perspective on Christianity were branded as heretics or they were eradicated. In this way, falsehoods compiled in the 4th century have come down to us as established facts. Eusebius was employed by the Roman Emperor Constantine who made Christianity the state religion of the empire and gave literalist Christianity the power it needed to begin the final eradication of paganism 
and Gnosticism. And it took them up until somewhere in the mid 700s, 800s, possibly even in the 900s to even eradicate some of those different groups of Gnostics, which actually still exist today because they went underground in different forms of life. Because they were the true Christed ones because they understood what the Christ was. So uh, Alvin Boyd Kuhn, who is my probably, I'll go on record to say in this, I'll go out on a limb with him and say that he probably is my favorite author. And I have all of his writings. That he, he authored a large number of books. He was a linguistic, spoke seven languages. He was an educator. Uh, he, had, he did his doctrinal theses in 1932 or three or four on theosophy and was the only man ever to get a doctrine on a title such as Theosophy, which Theosophy come out of Thurgist, which was the ancient Pythagorean wisdom of God schools. You know, we would today we would call them uh, higher schools of learning. And so, Alvin Boyd Coon, this is the shadow of the third century, and I would dare any of you to read this. I double dog dare you to read this one. Uh, I think you would find yourself spinning your wheel would just go crazy. And I would have to warn you up front, Alvin Boyd Coon was a linguist, and he understood language, he understood the communication of words and how to communicate words, so when you read him, you have to get your dictionary. <laughs> You'll have to get your dictionary to try to stay up with him and follow the things that he says. He expands your vocabulary. Yeah, yeah, he will do that. He will help you yeah. grow your vocabulary. And so here he is quoting, and I'm, I'm just, or I'm writing, I'm, I'm reading what he has said. He said, if Augustine stands as the founder of Christian theology, no less surely as you surmise the founder of Christian ecclesiastical system. And this is true with the, the two of them that he's talked about. As well as being perhaps its most important early historians. It is indeed a notable circumstance that these two prime instigators of the Christian movement inscribe each a statement which in essence and in effect practically negate all the basic claims of the religion they extolled and instituted. Mm -hmm. Do you want me to read that to you again? Yes. yes. So that you got to get this. If Augustine stands as the founder of Christian theology, no less surely as you surmise the founder of Christian ecclesiastical system, as well as being perhaps its most important early historian. It is indeed a notable circumstance that these two prime instigators of the Christian movement inscribed each a statement which in essence and in effect practically negate all the basic claims of the religion they extolled and instituted. Would you like to know what that claim was? Let me just read it to you. Both Judaism and Christianity owed everything they possessed to the Egyptians. All right. I said, I'll read that one more. That's their claim. They claim that. Christianity introduced no new element in the constitution of the soul. In other words, what I'm saying to you, there's not anything new that you can read in anywhere in the New Testament or in the Bible. And I, I you know, I claim or I promote myself as a supporter and searcher of the Christian Bible. For me and to me, it is the most phenomenal and greatest book on the face of the earth that I say, and I make this as public statements everywhere I go, that I do not think we have even come close to tapping what it says. Amen. And I think that my uh, consensus of that comes from my research and my study, and the more I research and the more I study, the more I realize that it truly is a living book, that it's as much alive as it's ever been. But when you do what we have done through the promotion of these antagonists that started this 
1,700 years ago and try to make this a history rather than to realize that it never was a history. It's always been a mystery. It still is a mystery. And that mystery is an ongoing sign of the, of the unfoldment of God itself. And that unfoldment is constantly unfolding itself in you as God. Yes. And that sometimes it's so difficult for us to see. So here were their claims. This was the claims of both Eusebius and both Augustine. They claimed that Judaism and Christianity owed everything they possessed to the Egyptians of old. So when you and me, if you study Egyptian mythology, and, and I admit that I do study a lot of Egyptian mythology, I find the stories that are in the New Testament Bible told, same stories, the story of Lazarus, uh, I, you know, it doesn't matter. Most any story that you find in the New Testament Bible, you'll find it in Egyptian mythology or you'll find it in some of the, uh, the Enuma Elish or some of the other ancient, ancient, ancient writings that, that are available to anybody if you would do the work to read it. But most people won't do the work to read the Bible. I, you know, I have people say, well, I've read the Bible through and through. Would you understand? Not a damn word. <laughs> yeah. Why'd you read it? Yeah. Can't understand it. What good is it? You read the thing and you can't understand it. No, you're confused. That's why they well, I'm more confused now than I was. <laughs> Do you know why? Because you're reading a book that you've tried to lock into a history and it never was a history. It's always been a mystery. Amen. And the mystery has always been God in you. That's yes. always been. It's always been the the yes. mystery's always been about the, the dying yes. and resurrection. He said, what I do, you can do. What I do, you should do. I think even greater works than this. We throw that up. No, can't be. I'll just read you a little note that I wrote. One of the greatest hindrances we have when trying to talk about God, I find that harder and harder constantly because how do you talk about that that can't be talked about? <laughs> how do you find that which is undefinable? How do you describe that that's indescribable? I mean, you know, how do you talk about nothing? <laughs> I mean, I, I, the, more I, I, the, the more I get into this phenomenal nonsense, the greater it gets. <laughs> it becomes more phenomenal. <laughs> the more I look into the nothing, the more I go, wow, it's better than any dope I ever smoked. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. Or any drink I ever drank. It's phenomenal. Yeah, you can tell if you if you and I will take the time to set aside and meditate and get lost in no time. Just get lost in that those moments, God itself will reveal itself to you. Amen. And he'll do it. Even out of this book you call the Bible. Yes. Yes. But the greatest hindrance that I have in trying to talk about God is to put God in time when God is outside time. Selah. So how am I going to talk about God in time when God's outside time? You can't limit God to time. God's not limited to time. Never has been. Never will be. So God don't measure time the way that you and I will measure time. This is a leftover from a conference we did down in uh, Bradenton, Florida a few weeks ago. Well, those folks were, they were lit up. They were turned on. And uh, I want to talk about time. Let me just put something on the board. This is, uh, this is uh, perfect for the weekend, isn't it? <laughs> but, yeah, what about that? Synchronicity, the cross. How can you have Easter weekend and not talk about the cross? Well, you know, when we talk about the cross, we're going to talk about uh, the equinoxes. And the solstice. 
However, what I want to do with this, and I want to show you something, and, and I want you to see what we have done and where we're at with this thing that we call time, is we try to take this, uh, of course this we will, we will just, uh, this is Easter. Realize that uh, September the 21st, March the 21st, the days are called equal, and that's where you get your equinox, right? right? That's where you get that, right? So it's just because it's equal. You know, do you understand what this line means? This line is where we get our uh, concept or idea of time, right? This yeah. this line is horizon or the earth, right? And this line, this vertical, is heaven. So when you take these two and you put them together, you come up with a divine cross, right? We all we all know that. And so what do we do with this? We count this period of time. Look at this. We count that 365. Or in other words, Enoch. Right? I know I told you a curve there when I did that. I did that on purpose. But how can you get 365 out of a circle that's only got 360 degrees in it? You have to cheat somewhere, don't you? So you've got to cheat to get that, to accomplish that feat. And the way they do that is, it's not really complicated. But let me just show you something right here. This is the longest day of the year. In other words, this day stretches out into what, like 16 hours, 15 or 16 hours, this is the shortest day of the year, December the 21st, and this day it shrinks back to what? 11 hours or something like that for day, day by time? Something, something like that. I'm just giving a rough estimate. You follow what I'm saying? And yet these two right here, March the 21st and September the 21st, they equal out 12 and 12. However, this day right here, and this day right here, have, this day has 24 hours and 16 minutes in it. And this day right here has 23 hours and uh, 47 minutes in it. It don't have 24 hours. Now, you have to think about that. This day, it's got 24 hours and 16 minutes in it. How do they do that? So what they did and what they've done with you and me is they come up with this thing they call it T-I-M-E. Time. They try to equal all of these out to 24 hours each one of them and give you 365 days with 24 hours and it, doesn't, it still doesn't measure out accurately. Right? Y'all know that. Nod your head and say yeah even though you don't. One of the greatest hindrances we have when we try to talk about God is God in time. But God is not in time. Thus, the problem we have when reading time material such as the Bible, which is written in time, therefore we call it history. Why do we do that? Because we don't have any other way to associate ourselves with it. So we call it history. But it wasn't. How many of you can kind of uh, that think about this a little bit? That the reason Jesus could say whatever happened to him, through him, and with him can happen with you and to you now. You know why? Because in God, it now's always been. There never was a then. The next, there never will be a tomorrow. It's all now. So when you take God out of this particular economy, we call it earth economy. You take God out of this dimension. God's still not measuring 24-hour days. Because He never did and never has. So God doesn't fit in history. And so what I wanted to do is I wanted to take this weekend and I wanted to take my time and I want to talk more about the mystery.
And the mystery has to do... I don't know who that is, don't you? That's the statement. You can't, you can't talk about time and you can't talk about mystery without talking about the stick man. Simply because everything in the scripture for my, for me and everything that I read about in other materials has to do with these seven functions that create a physical body. And in Hebrew I call them the seven yoms. And in Hebrew the word yom got translated for the word day, D-A-Y. And so when I talk about the seven yoms, I talk about the full facet of life that God has deposited itself in you as Him. And, and even I kind of reluctant to call it Him because God's not so much a Him or Her as it is It. Yes. And it's hard to say, well, no, bro, God's not a It. I, I know, but yes, the dilemma we have. Yeah, I understand. We, we do have a dilemma trying to talk about these things because, now I want to say this again, and I said this earlier, but I want to say this again, the theme of your life, the theme of the Scripture, the theme of what everything that I see of is about is the dying and resurrection of the God-man. In other words, what does that mean? And God didn't die in the human flesh, but that's exactly what we say. We use that, that analogy. God died, deposited Himself inside you. But how many of you realize if God's dead inside you, you're going to be dead? God ain't dead inside you. God's alive inside you. He always has been alive. And we use another analogy and we constantly say it. I say it. You hear we, You say, well, God's asleep in there. And I, say, I always say, wake up, damn it. I don't need some help. <laughs> you know, if he's asleep, won't wake him up. So we use these phrases and we're trying to talk about this thing that's in that we can't talk about. But really, we can. We really can. And what we have to do is we have to collect some things that we've thrown away. We have to collect some things that God gave us that are really special. And one of those is common sense. Amen. <laughs> you see, in religion, what they, they tell you to do is do not pay attention to your common sense. Amen. Throw it out. Just trust me. <laughs> Just believe. I know it's not possible. I know you have a hard time believing it, but just believe. If you just believe, only believe. And you know what your common sense is sitting there saying? Don't do that. Don't do that. <laughs> Throw that out. Don't make. But we need to. We need to gain that. We need to come back and capture that because then we will begin to realize that this is wrapped up in a language. And we need to understand the language. And we need to know how to talk that language. We need to know how to understand what it is about when we talk about the death and the resurrection of the God man. Did anybody die? No. You ain't even gonna die. You're gonna lay your physical body down because you're just gonna either wear it out or use it up and just discard it and get rid of it. But you ain't gonna die. You're gonna live again and again and again and again and again. And again. And so what I want to do is I want to learn how to tap into that life of living. And that's what it means to resurrect the God man that's inside me. That's what we're talking about. And for me, it's a, it's a real key mystery that has to do with the soul and has to do with an understanding of the soul and also an understanding of the language of the soul, which is in the Scripture. And so for me, that will be my... That will be my Part of what I want to talk about this weekend, and I want to put this up here for you. Let you you can be looking at this. These are just some uh, Hebrew words that I use, and I, of course I know that you will. And I want you to see the similarity of these words. No. And then I will tell you what these words are. No.
Now, this is a word for dust. Alif, Fe, Arash. This is the Hebrew first letter of the Hebrew alphabet. It's called the Alif. It's a word that we use. It's a symbol. It's a sign. It's a sign. And this sign is a sign for God. Symbol. Alif. Look here. Alif, 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 Alif. So all of these first letter characters in these what you would call words, which are not words, these are actually formulas of the energy. And these formulas of energy, we make words out of them. But these formulas right here are phenomenal in Scripture. Like for instance, this one right here, we call this one Alif, Fayut, Rash, Afar, Dust. And actually it means particles of light. Rash is the Hebrew, has a 200 value and it means fire. And it's where we get our word light from. Okay? And if you'll notice, you've got fire, 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 fire. And this word right here, yeah. Alif, Arash, Arash, this is the word for light. You'll notice that word, Alif, Arash, Arash, Alif, Fayum, Arash, this is dust, this is light. You can see the similarities of the word so you can understand that they carry value. And the value that they carry has a lot to do with the word itself. So when you begin to see these words and you begin to realize what these words are, they they change your perspective. They they change uh, they change you. They cause you to begin to, to resurrect. Let me do this. So that I get them on the the right level right here. Alif Wav Arash. Wav, that's Wav, 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 that's the number for man, six. This is light. This right here, Alif Arash Arash. You're not going to believe this word. I don't go kick the bell. It's the word curse. First place you find it is in Genesis chapter 3. And you don't have a clue what it means. Because you, what do you think a curse is? You, how many of you ever felt like you was cursed? You are. You really are. Do you know what it means to be cursed? What it means to be cursed, and I'm going back and if I'm going to use this language of 2,000 or 3,000 or 4,000 year old language, when I'm talking about you being cursed, what I'm talking about is there's a tension continually going on inside you and that is where the light has been slowed down and where the light also is trying to speed up and they seem to struggle against each other so that the light inside you is struggling with the light outside you to combine themselves to become one. That ain't bad. If you can catch up to that, that ain't a bad thing. You think it is? But it's a thing of tension because you feel like there's a struggle right? because the light inside you is trying to catch up to the light outside you. The light inside you is God slowed down to physical form. And they call it curse. And then we take this word, which if you'll notice, this word right here, Ali Rash Rash, Ali Rash Rash, curse. This word right here is. <coughs> It's a Hebrew word, ar arat. Have you ever heard of that word? Arat. What is that word, arat? No <laughs> Hey, look at this. If I take, if I take the top off the end of it, it's the same identical word as curse. So what does it mean when I add a top to it? You can tell you what that means? When I add a top, what I did with this word, this Hebrew clip, is I took this word and I put it in this dimension. So what I did when I come up with the word ar, right in Hebrew, that's a Hebrew word, it's not an English word. I took the light that's on the inside with the light that's on the outside and I deposited them in a dimension 
called time. Wow. <laughs> so now then, when I am on the mountain of Ararat, the light inside me is struggling with the light outside me wow. to live, move, and have its being in this dimension called time. Yes. It's not a mountain somewhere that they got a boat hung up on. Because the ark is you. Amen. And the only boat that's hung on that mountain of time and the struggle of life that's inside light is you. Yes. Yes. And all you're doing is trying to struggle to be who God's designed you to be. And I tell you, once we begin to realize what's happening and who we are, you can cease from your struggle and you can yes. cease from all of the labor and you can enter into your rest. Yes. Yeah. And, and you don't have to be a lightning scientist to get this. You can just look at it and see these words as they build and the similarities and how they, they actually, is, I'm starting right here in Genesis chapter 2. I'm going to Genesis chapter 8. And I'm taking the same word and all I'm doing is I'm just beginning to change it around a little bit. That's all God wants to do is change it around a little bit so that you can understand who you are and where you are so that you can understand that your job in this journey is to allow the God man to stand up and wake up. Oh, that's, right. that's the man that's always been in the woman, in, whoever, always been inside you and still inside you. Man, will you say those eight words one more time? Okay, the, the top right here. The top one is translated in Genesis 2 7 for dust. Okay? This one right here is translated in Genesis 1. I, I'll try to, I may try to work with this one tomorrow. It depends on how much time I've got. I want to try to work with this particular word. I want to work with this word said. So, and one of the reasons I want to work with that word because God is not a man, so God doesn't possess vocal cords other than those that you have. So how does God speak? And that word actually, translated said, has to do more with an emanation of proceeding, something that comes out. And it's like uh, vibration. Exactly. It's the vibration of light. If you take a DNA, if you take a DNA and you you understand what I'm saying here? Twist it around. If you took it, you're looking at it from the side. Have you ever thought about looking at it from the top? Do you know what it looks like when you look? We're looking at it from the side. What happens if you look at it from the top down? That's what it looks like. A circle inside a circle. So what's going on inside this DNA? What's going on inside this? If they Well, scientists look at it and they look into it and say, well, there's nothing going on inside. That's right. <laughs> Just listen to yourself. What do you mean there's nothing going on inside it? Everything's going on inside it simply because nothing is everything. Because if you understand a better word for God is nothing, and all the ancient materials understood that, and they understood that God was the great no thing, and if you called it in Hebrew, it would be called the in. It's off earth. The vast nothingness of light. So, yeah, they look at the DNA as look at the side. Everybody's standing there looking at the side of the thing. Oh, yeah, squiggly. <laughs> yeah, two poles. All these little crossbars. Going. But let's go up top and look down in it. And that's what it looks like. You know why? Because swirling in it is <coughs> nothing. That's everything. You can call it wind. It's because 
when we say said, what? How do you get said? It's because there's air coming up outside you. If you touch yourself right here, you'll feel the air coming up outside you vibrating as it comes up outside you and makes what you and I call words and it's God. It's Logos. Yes. And they said, say it. So in Genesis chapter 1, this is used ten times. And the reason it's used ten times are three of them. Three of them represent light. Life and love, and they unfold themselves in trilogies of three and manifest in the physical body. And so the physical body is represented by three aspects one, two, three. That, does that make sense? Yeah. And so, when we go back and we start to look at this ancient material, all the ancient myths, let me just read you this and I'll quit. I, this, there is no where you quit. You just have to stop and unhook. All the ancient myths were stories written about the subject of a virgin born, dying, and resurrecting Son of God. All of them. If you go back and study the ancient myths, you'll see. I have a book called The Sixteen Crucified Saviors. Sixteen of them. I have another book that lists 36 of them. Different, different ones from all over the world and all of them were the stories were told the same the stories were virgin born except, except subjects of a virgin born dying and resurrecting son of God this central theme runs through all ancient material this story or myth was and is the story about each and every human being born on the earth with the potential to be truly pure God man or God woman. Thus every person born is born with a divine ability. You know that yourself. This ability must be allowed to wake up or to be stirred up by certain processes or works. This term in the Ancient mythology was called the great work. Also, this term is called transformation. Also, this term is called being born again. Also, this term is called being saved. Also, this term is called experiencing salvation. Put a lot of different terminologies on the same exact thing. But what you're doing is you're experiencing something inside you that's awakening. Forty plus years ago, that happened to me. That happened to me in a motel room in a phenomenal way and my life was changed and do you know how my life was changed it was changed mainly because within me i had what was called a phenomenal emotional experience that emotional experience changed me transformed my life put my life on a different path and every one of us experienced that at different intervals at different times what happened was something began to awaken inside me and it really wasn't asleep what happened I began to awaken to that that was already awake inside me and so all of the ancient mythologies talks about this and they all talk about that there was a term known and as the philosopher's stone which was a symbol of transmuting or transforming lower animal nature into human <laughs> divine nature that, that particular term was also known and are called alchemy. And y'all all heard these terms, I'm sure you have. Which meant to turn base metal, or in other words, lead into gold. This was not meant to be taken literally. This was not meant to be taken literally. It tells you that if you take it literally, you kill it. It tells you that. But we ignore that it says that. So what do we want to do? We want to take it literally. There had to be a literal Moses. 
No, they didn't. <laughs> it's like someone told me, oh, many years ago, but Lynn, you have to have a core belief. I said, no, I don't. Oh, but you have to. I said, well, you may think I have to, but I don't think I have to. And so it's me, and so for me, I don't have no core belief. I said, I don't believe nothing. <laughs> you have to believe something. I said, I don't believe nothing, but I do know a few things. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to base my life on what I know and just go forward with that. And if, even if it's just that I just know a few things, I'm not going to try to believe anything. I'm going to try to just go on with what I know. So tomorrow I want to share with you some of the things that I know. Amen. I quit. Yeah. They just watch. You know how many years I refuse letting go away? <laughs> oh, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And I'm not mimicking anything. But it never dawned on me until he said, Is he speaking for you? He said, if I don't go, he won't come. And I can't have both of them. Can you? Can you? What did he say? If I don't go, the spirit of truth won't come. And finally, and I point the finger at the young lady that convinced me it was time for me to let him go so truth could come. You remember that? It was raining like cats and dogs and a place where we had the meeting flooded all around us. Yep. Lynn couldn't get to his motor home and yet he wouldn't go home. That was <coughs> Brother Lyle, we was we was on the side of a bank of a lake. Beautiful facilities. I probably 75 or 80 people, I don't know how many come. And it went to raining. And rain and rain yeah. and rain. Was you there? Mm -hmm. You was there, I know. The guy with a pickup truck, he just bought a Ford pickup truck. Man, yeah. And he let, he would ride people into the meeting and back out to the dry ground. Yep. But during that meeting, when I finally purpose in my heart, I wanted truth. Yeah. I wanted truth. I don't care if I have to let Moses go. I don't care if I have to the Apostle Paul go. Amen. Did you ever notice? that the most of our preaching and teaching is about somebody else, what somebody else said. Paul said, Jesus said, Peter said, do you know that? But all the time, the man, the man that said he had to go said something. You have heard it said, but I say. I say. So, that said, I'm ready. Come on, sister partner. Bless you. Lynn, you just continue to blow me away. And I'm so thankful for you. Yeah. <laughs> thankful for the study and for the hours and the days and the weeks and the months and the years. Yeah. So I want to tell you all about some unusual things that have been happening. Um, first of all, Lynn says this most of the time, but we don't talk. But everything that I have to say is going to dovetail really nicely with the exceptional foundation that he's laying through the logos, through the word. I've got three videos to show you over the course of this weekend, and they're 10 minutes each, but they will spur exceptional conversation. The first one is called Astonished, 
and it's basically the nature of our reality and what's happening to us. The second is going to explain the male and the female principle that's within each of us, beautifully explain it. And the third one is activating your Merkaba. Does everybody know what their Merkaba is? Yeah. I was going to start off by saying, um, we flew in today and boy, my Merkaba was bright. <laughs> <laughs> because this is where we're headed. We are headed into unprecedented times of the miraculous. Yes. Um, things that should be normal and every day. Um, things that even five years ago we wouldn't even talk about because we didn't have the technology to back it up. The spiritual technology or the understanding even to embrace what we're talking about today. So I want to share a story with you that happened to me. You know, I sat and I, I don't know how many times I started to uh, write down what I felt I was supposed to speak on. And as was the case most of the time, everything came within the last week. And uh, how many of you are noticing that you are manifesting more quickly than what you were before. In other words, our thoughts and our focused emotions on any given circumstance are happening quickly. Can you attest to that? Does anyone not understand what I'm talking about? You know that we're creators and we're learning our Christhood. <coughs> We're learning that we are God walking in flesh and blood. And one of the things that I'm learning is to be very, very mindful about what we say, what we do, because we are literally seeding into the fabric of our reality. Back in 1994, most of the Wherever I went, and while I can attest to this, a prophet would pull me aside and talk to me and tell me of the things that I would do and talk to both of us at times. But here's this, this incredible book of volumes of words that I was given cassette tapes and I would go home and I would type them up and I would study them and I would try to understand them as best as I could. So let me just read you a little bit before I tell you my story. And most of you know that you know the story of my son Chris that lost his left arm and his left leg in a, in a catastrophic motorcycle accident. But anyway, this prophet named Michael Ratliff pulled Lyle and I aside and began to talk to us about something that was going to be happening to us. Um, he said, so understand this, I'm enlarging your borders and broadening your feet beneath you because a new way has opened. A door has been opened that no one can close and I'm giving you the key of David. He says, therefore be careful of what you say and be careful of what you do. For the Lord says that you're entering into a new increment of glory, a holier place that requires holier hands for holier things. <clears throat> and it goes on to say that even though there are giants in the land, God has already gone before us to melt their hearts and paralyze them and not us. Our losses will be restored, even flesh and blood losses. I didn't understand what that meant until in the emergency room when Chris was being operated on to remove his left leg I had this prophetic word come back to me verbatim and I knew that we go through things for the purposes of learning and I'm convinced for the purposes of manifesting who we are which is Christ which is resurrecting the dead bones and coming alive to our true nature. So tonight I just want to talk a little bit about two exceptional circumstances that happened to me within the last week.
I have a senior citizen that's in my life, and I go and visit this person regularly, and they are in an assisted living facility. <clears throat> And this person told me that they were having trouble eating. She has memory issues, and so I realized that she didn't have her teeth in. Do I have to stay here? <laughs> and so I went to her room. I went to her room, and I found her teeth sitting on the top of the sink. And I thought, wow, well, that's why she's having trouble eating. And so I picked up her teeth, and as I turned them over, I noticed that they hadn't been cleaned in a very long, long time. And I felt sad for this person uh, because they're supposed to be helped with these simple tasks like brushing their teeth. And the teeth were actually black around the top part of what is supposed to be the gum line. And I felt it in my gut. I felt it in my gut. And I felt so bad for her. And as I said, I know that you're not supposed to brush dentures like with toothpaste, but I grabbed lots of it. And I just started to scrub and scrub and scrub. And as I did that, I was choking back tears, like I am right now. And I was moved with compassion and with pity. So I got them somewhat clean and handed them to her and I said, here, let's see if you can eat them. And I know better than this because I started to judge that circumstance. And one of the messages that we are taught is that in order to apprehend the kingdom, that we have to cease judging between good and evil. Because judging between good and evil reinforces the fabric of our reality. Because we are divinity, because we are endowed with this Christhood, whatever I decree is, whatever I decree is. So, I, on my way home, called my sister and I told her about this circumstance. And I got tears in my eyes feeling so sorry for this senior citizen, this beautiful senior citizen that is losing her faculties and her memory. And as I told her, I cried. When I got home, I told Lyle. And I said, they are supposed to help her. What is wrong with them? Don't they, why is she paying so much money? And I mean, I went through my whole rigmarole, and again, I'm telling you, I know better than to do this. I know better. I am not kidding you, and I'm so glad Lyle, as my witness, saw this. The next day, I went into the bathroom to check my makeup before going out. And I did the old. I found a little coffee. And guess what? My gums were black. Not kidding. This whole section down here was black. I was taken back. I did not put two and two together. I just thought, wow, that is a huge lettuce leaf down there. And so I went and got my toothbrush and scrubbed and squished out my mouth and looked again and thought, what the heck? Grabbed my glasses, went over to my magnifying mirror and sat down. My gums were black. <laughs> It lasted for less than a day. But I showed Lyle's cloud look at this. Of course, he went. Then as I thought about it, I thought, could it be? I know what I teach. 
that when we focus on things, when we leave judgment behind, and we focus on things that we shouldn't, we enter right back into that type of thing that we create when we discern between good and evil. But I tell you this because once you leave behind judgment and you begin to um, navigate the areas above this lower point, that you have abilities that you did not know that you had. So I tell you that embarrassing story to say you need to be careful about what you say and what you think because you're manifesting reality. We're going to get into that at some depth tomorrow. And I want us, us to really understand what is happening to us and through us not only in our personal lives, but in the, the nature around us. Um, you are beginning to manifest a natural ability that is going to change the face of our reality and our world. Let me read you a quote. Here's to the crazy ones, the misfits, the rebels, the troublemakers, the round pegs and the square holes, the ones who see things differently. They're not fond of rules, and they have no respect for the status quo. You can quote them, disagree with them, glorify or vilify them. About the only thing you can't do is ignore them, because they change things. They push the human race forward, and while some may see them as the crazy ones, we see genius. Because the people who are crazy and don't think they can change the world are the ones that do. So this weekend, I think we're going to be pushing the envelope a little bit. So the Merkaba is a manifested light body with masculine and feminine energy, energy working in tandem with one another. We're going to learn a little bit more of that. And the next story I want to tell you is something that happened to me while I was sleeping. Because I know that I know that I know that I know that just like the stories of people disappearing and reappearing, that's an ability that you have. And we are going to be seeing much more of it. I was told several years ago that I could go back and change things in time. Time is not linear, it's a loop. And there are certain times when you can step into this place of no time and change circumstances within the loop. I don't know how, but I know we can. Because that which is internal and eternal is not based on time. So when we begin to talk about our supernatural abilities, things might get a little uncomfortable because we've been based in time for so long. But that's not where you belong. We're only here as sojourners learning to trust and to manifest our Godhood. So this next story, and maybe you can help me with it. I know that I'm supposed to tell you about it, but I don't understand it all. I know that when the Merkaba is initially activated, you travel in your sleep. 
when it is fully activated, you travel with your whole body. <coughs> but I know that I'm traveling back and forth in time because of what happened to me two nights ago. It was a rather long dream. And I saw my son, Ryan, who is 37 years old, and I saw him as he is today. But standing next to him was my son, Christian. He's the one that lost his left arm and leg. And he was only seven years old. And in my dream, I honed in on his left arm and his left leg. And I knew that I had to do something. I went over to him and I grabbed his shoulders hard and firm and I shook him. And I said, Chris, you have to listen to me. Chris, you have to listen to me. And he looked at me and I said, promise me that you will never get on a motorcycle. Promise me that you will never get on a motorcycle. Promise me, and I shook him. And I said, because mommy has had a very bad dream where you lost your left arm and your left leg, so you have to promise me. And when I woke up from my dream, I was soaked with tears, and I was still in that other place. Wherever we go, I was still in that other place. And I believe that things happen to me for the purposes of expressing a technology, <coughs> teaching, and understanding. But I want you to be brave with these intuitive insights that are coming to us because it's divinity speaking to you. And because we have been so programmed, like Lynn was saying, I can't believe that, or no, that's, I can't go there. No, you can't. You have to be brave. You are pioneering a new place in consciousness that not very many people have gone during this loop. We are waking up to our divinity. We're waking up and we're beginning to understand that nothing is impossible. Nothing. You are the creator. You are Christ. So the technology that's coming <coughs> is not coming from me or Lynn or Amos or Ray or anybody. It's coming from within you. Yes. Because each one has your own unique and specific path that you need to tread. And insight will come if you just still the mind. And understanding will come. I don't know what happened with Chris. It's not the first time I had a situation happen where I had to speak to, to the past yeah. to alter the future. But I know that these abilities are inherent within us. So you have to learn to trust those voices that speak to you. These are shamanic in nature, these activities. Shamans are given the charge to bring healing to the earth. They are also given the charge to anchor energy, incoming energy that is not of our spectrum. Has anyone heard this before? They are part of the Melchizedek Priesthood, which everybody has that opportunity <coughs> to become a way shower, a light bringer. They are here by the millions, and you are going to be anchoring a frequency on the earth that is going to produce the supernatural dimension yes. above and beyond where we've been. 
I'm talking to you about these things because I want you to be brave. And to understand that as you let go, as you let go of this, of this place called time, that you're going to enter into a whole different dimension, a, a place of abiding and understanding that will produce the miraculous in this plane to the point where it becomes commonplace. So tomorrow, three videos, 10 minutes each. They will spark a lot of conversation. They will stir your consciousness, your thoughts, your spirit. And they will bring you to a different place in understanding. I just want to encourage you to please be open and be brave and be willing to lay aside the former things so that we can go on to perfection. We're mortals, but there comes a time when the mortal must put on <coughs> immortality, the corruptible must put on incorruption, in the twinkling of an eye, the sound of the last trumpet. One of the things that I want to talk about um, again uh, tomorrow is symptoms in particular that people are experiencing as their frequency begin begins to escalate. Has anyone heard of uh, the new catchphrase, ascension symptoms? Has anyone experienced unusual things in their body? Please tell me. Sound, a sound in my head constantly is different. I don't know how to describe it. Yes, that's a very common symptom. Yeah. Who else? Yeah. Just say them out loud so we can comfort one another. The sound like a ringing, almost like a, like we used to when we were children would walk under power lines and we'd hear that singing or crickets. Francis? Mine has been like a roaring and uh, words echoing, resonating in my head. I couldn't watch TV because the sound on the TV was like going inside of my head and radiating. That's all I can Mark? I've always had what is called a uh, phonic memory. I don't, it's not a photographic, but I can hear anything and repeat it, and I seemingly are losing my memory of here and gaining a memory of a world I don't know. Yes, yes. Who else? In the last six months, uh, I have, I have heard, and it's as clear as, as I can hear you. I, I, one time I heard uh, like uh, uh, the CDs in a truck. It was early in the morning and this man, this a trucker was talking to another man and he was also singing this song and it was as clear as it could be. And I heard this over a period of like two weeks. I would hear early in the morning, I would hear him. And then I heard, it was like I heard my daughter and she, she was, she was doing like these ticker tapes on the, you know, like a, early in the morning when they have what is this anyway and they they say all these words real fast and they're changing stocks and all this and it was as clear as it could be I mean I, I heard her with a you know it wasn't a dream but not but I'm still hearing it I can I can just hear like in another room and I will hear just a part I'll hear a song you know and what it's that's called it, it's totally clear it's called being bi-dimensional well, I, did, I didn't know what it was. I had no idea, and I don't know if it's 
something that God is beginning to do in all of us. Usually it is. I know that, but it's new for me. Well, a shaman in indigenous cultures are identified by their ability to hear voices or see visions. <clears throat> Unfortunately, in our society, we drug them and lock them up. Yes. And they're considered psychotic. So as a, just as a forum here to encourage you, again, I know, I know that I'm a forerunner, and others are forerunning, and they're forerunning the course for the purposes of encouragement. Because Lyle and I, back in the 90s, we heard people talking in the house, outside our bedroom window, up in the attic, all around us, and we could never pinpoint where it was coming from. And I'm just so thankful that he heard it too, because I thought I was losing my mind. And really, we are. was. <laughs> <laughs> We are. You know, there's how many examples are there just in our Bible alone of people having dreams and seeing visions and hearing voices. Well, we have been so couched in logic and in the linear idea of things that now that we're beginning to understand some of the mechanics of manifesting the kingdom, that energy is beginning to rise quickly. And you're beginning to hear you're beginning to see, you're beginning to dream dreams and have visions, and, and these things are going to become very naturally supernatural. So we'll talk more about these symptoms um, tomorrow, but I just, I just felt like I needed to take the time and say that it's okay, that you are losing your mind, but it's a good thing. <laughs> What's happening is a, a divine intrusion from other dimensions. And that's all I can say, it's just happening. And it's really a, a, a wonderful thing that's beginning to manifest in us and through us. I was um, walking uh, in the hallway of my home the other day, and I, we have a family friend, and I'll call her um, Sarah. But I was walking through the house, and, and, I, and I felt this whoosh. And the whoosh came with information. And the wish was, Sarah is pregnant. And so I thought, oh, so I went into Lyle's office and I said, guess what? He said, what? Oh, I said, I heard a voice tell me that Sarah's pregnant. Oh, And of course, Lyle by now just goes, hmm. He doesn't. <laughs> the weirdness meter gets cranked up around me, let me tell you. So um, I had the opportunity to talk to Sarah. Um, later on that day, and I said, Sarah, I heard that you're pregnant, and her eyes got real big, and she said, well, I am late by just a couple of days. I said, well, that's, you know, I don't know what that means, I just heard it, and I just felt like I, I'm close enough to her that I can share the weirdness with her. <laughs> and so then later on that day, she came, uh, back by and she said, I started my cycle, so I'm not pregnant. I said, oh, okay. But in my mind, it was like, okay. So two weeks later, she came to me and she said, um, can I confide in you? And I said, of course. She said, I'm pregnant. She said, I've been hemorrhaging for two weeks and um, I probably will lose the baby. Well, when she left the house, I heard the baby. And he wants to live. So we're beginning to communicate at levels that we're not used to. And I'm telling you, the more you exercise that intuitive muscle, the stronger it gets. 
And you know, sometimes my dreams are pizza dreams or, you know, whatever. But I cut myself some slack and say, it's okay, I'll get it next time. But this intuitive function that is beginning, how many of you have had an escalation in your intuitive functions? Okay, 10? I mean, that's, that's a lot. I mean, back five, ten years ago, we weren't even talking about intuition or intuitive functions, were we? But the more that we begin to exercise that ability, I don't even want to call it a gift, because it really is an gift <coughs> that everyone does. Right. So anyway, yeah, I don't want to take too much more time, but I wanted to plant those seeds let you know what we're going to talk about, at, at least my, my end of the spectrum here. I think it's going to dovetail perfectly into what you're speaking about, especially um, the video on the masculine and the feminine and what they do within us, how we each are masculine and feminine. And then we'll end with the um, video on the Merkaba. And if you're not familiar with that, has anyone ever heard the term before, Merkaba? You know, it means uh, something to ride in. It uh, in in scripture, and Lane, you might want to help me here. Elijah's was called a Merkava, Merkava with a V, um, but it was his chariot. And one of the most fascinating things that um, I hope you came away with the last time we met is is I showed a video um, about our son being in a binary system and how um, we are regaining information that we lost during the Dark Ages. Does anyone remember that, that video? Um, again, time being more circular than linear, um, we are looping through different ages, and that loop is basically called alchemy, because we go from high culture, which is the golden ages, where we basically we saw people with flying carpets in the, in the golden age. I mean, they had these phenomenal abilities where they could speak a thing and it would manifest. But then we were lower, and I love the scripture that says um, the creature was subject to futility, not willingly, but by the one who subjected it in hope. So here we've experienced this immersion, um, being in a real high culture, we have, have been experiencing an immersion or a baptism into dense human consciousness. So forgetting wasn't a bad thing, it was a necessary thing. We had to experience this, and we'll talk about that a little bit more tomorrow. But again, not linear, we're just beginning to remember what we always had. It's been in here the whole time. We just had to sleep for a while. We had to experience the place. Of weeping and gnashing of teeth. It's been vital for our education, it has gotten me. Vital. But we're rounding the corner now. <laughs> and we're coming up and we're beginning to remember who we are and why we're here and what our task is. Good stuff? Are you looking forward to tomorrow? Yes. I am too. Thank you. you have the ability and the end time. To end? No. Yes. Yes. The creation of human love. It gives. We read it over and over. No beginning, no ending. 
somewhere I bought the program that I would end. Did missionary work, evangelistic work, call a prophet? I call a lot of things. For over 40 years, without really knowing who I was, therefore I never I could not enjoy being who I am. Now, I can absolutely tell you from my heart, I just enjoy being. I have no agenda. I don't have to preach. I don't have to, I don't have to. I just enjoy being me. And my lovely wife never condemns. And sometimes when, when the me is not what maybe it ought to be, I think I said that right. <laughs> There's no condemnation. Amen. And see, the major thing, I got I I refuse to condemn myself. Yeah. So when I got when I when I got to the point where I couldn't condemn me, there's no condemnation in there, how can I give it to you? I just enjoy being who I am. But I earnest desire, and I think I'm almost there. I feel like I'm almost at the border. I may be, I may be coming to the Ruth and Naomi experience. You come to the border where you got a chance to go back, but you know you're going into a strange land and you don't even speak that language. Yes. And it's like Barbara said, folks. God, it, where, where we act is so awesome. Just think when you take the next step, what it's going to be like. Okay. I want, I want, I want to come to a place where time is no longer. Well, I read for years where he raised his right hand, and the first thing he said, time. Be no longer. He said, you ready to go home? Ready to go, go to your room? You want to go eat? You want to go fuss? You want to go discuss? Can I say one thing, Brad? Yes, ma'am. At least 25 years ago, God spoke something to me. I was actually on a missionary trip in El Salvador. I was in the kitchen, minding my own business, making me a cup of coffee. And I heard as clear as a bell, I'm going to take time out for you. And I thought, oh, that's good. God's going to set aside some, some time. He's going to spend some time with other people. But now I understand what he was saying. I'm going to take time out. Yeah, yeah. Amen. Oh, yes. 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 And this is part of the next step that we're going to take. He's going to take time out of our thinking, out of our mental processes. We're going to leave time and we're going to enter into our Godness, which is timelessness. Praise. Hallelujah. Yeah, yeah. Great. Can I say one thought? Yes, sir. Every religion has a time stamp on what they think this is. Yeah. Plus all yeah. the other ancient mystery books. Mm -hmm. So when I got into the things of God, I had a time stamp on every verse. So this was the great time was the greatest hindrance to the mysteries of God until I understood time. And now it's the greatest encouragement because I know that this was not written in time and I don't belong in time. So the mystery of time, we are coming to a divine, in, I love your term here, a divine intrusion that leads to divine infusion and transmutation.
until we get to the point that we understand the mystery of time. And when you remove time, you remove judgment, and then you remove the, one of the biggest hindrances for this book, and that's law. Yes. Yes. We love it. Very good. Yes. How many, how many has heard the phrase, I'm not under the law, but I'm under grace? Yeah. Yeah. Did it ever occur to you the moment you went yeah. under grace, you went under a law? Yes. Yeah. 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 See, as long as you're under, mm -hmm. and nobody knows that better than I do. Because, brother, I was under for a long time. Amen. We all were. I read recently, somebody wrote this. If, if I were it right. That Christianity has taught an illusion and we pretended that it was truth. You had to pretend it's like men said, just just believe, just believe. Trust me, trust me. How many have ever heard that word, just believe me? Trust me. Oh, you, you don't have to understand, just trust me. Illusion. And somewhere we we pretended that it was truth. Yep. Until actually in the pretend that it was truth, we couldn't hear anything else. We blocked truth. Pretending anything will block reality. I know the experience. So, basically, my interpretation of the scripture was an illusion. Exactly. Yeah. Because I took it as a little book. Right. And when I take it as a when, when, when I took it that way, I I presented an illusion. Yeah. And then here comes a, of course someday. Yeah. Someday. Always someday. After a while, <laughs> tomorrow. I was told in 1978 that Jesus was coming to a place in Texas. Maybe, maybe you heard that. <coughs> Preston, the, the J. Preston Evie, you know, Brother Evie, some of you know. Went to their meeting, stood up on their platform, and I mean, Jesus was going to come midnight that night. And they all gathered together in this in Texas to welcome. Preston got up and said, "It's not so. <coughs> He's not coming. He's not coming. He's not coming." And they were ready to uh, do bodily damage, an illusion. And I found this out for myself. There is no truth. In the illusion, I have to pretend that it's truth, and it's not true. Praise God. He said it's expedient that I go away, not that I come back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's good. You know what? In, in these in these kind of fellowships, you're gonna be surprised. And how many things you leave here that you brought with you? Yes, I hope so. <laughs> yes. See, it was so hard for me to change my language. Still is. You know, I've, I've been in some of the foreign countries and they all have their language. I, I remember the, the Mexican people used to laugh at me. You talk funny, you talk funny. I said, you come to my country, you talk funny. It depends on what country is where you talk. So it's been hard for me to change my dialect. One of the, one of the hardest things that's been for me to change is God. 
he. You know, he, you ever notice it? And Lynn touched on it. Every time that, it's always him. Or he. And what did he say? It's nothing. See, but, and we're going we're gonna to be able to take some courses in language and some of our, some of our vocabulary in these settings. I'm ready, are you? I'm ready. God bless you. You, you somebody want to share something? You know? What time?